Hi guys, my name is Borodante, and welcome back to the game Concept Art. So in this series that we started very recently, I work on some key shots, concept art pieces for the horror game I'm working on, the active development of which has been slightly stalled for technical reasons, but we'll get back to it very soon. And for now I thought would take this opportunity to make this second episode in the series of concept art for the game. And yeah, I just really wanted to see that daddy long arms fully fleshed out in the game world and see the place, the location where it appears, because uh, there's a lot of specifics to that location, same as to the design of the character. And I never made any concept art about these things, and I feel like putting all thoughts together into one picture could really help me plan my work a lot more. Because if we look at the daddy long arms, uh, so far we pretty much have have like um, the model, a pretty big and somewhat fleshed out model of the character, but it's mostly like the upper arm. And I also worked on the elbow section, but the main concept of Daddy Long Arms is that this is a very big arm with the palm about the size of a human body. And the rest of the body is this very long sort of bandy arm. And on a very early stage of development, together with you guys, we decided that we really should go with actually making elbows, many, many repeating elbows, on the body of this character. So it will be a modular character where uh, the unique first part of it ends somewhere maybe around here. And at this point, we have a certain invisible connection that should work seamlessly with itself over and over again. So this will be another one like this and so on. So that's the idea about the character and this whole giant arm is growing from the ground, presumably being a part of this bigger creature that is spreading across the whole map. And while we clearly fleshed out the main feature of the character, the palm, we have yet to see how exactly it shows up, how exactly it works in the real world. And yeah, the biggest deal and always the least work through area in the way I usually work is the landscapes, because while I do work in many different ways, overall, I'm always kind of lean towards focusing on the character design and everything else is sort of secondary to me, and I feel like I should pay a bit more attention to it. It's not like I've never painted a landscape, I even concepted landscapes at work and for fun, uh, but yeah, I felt like we need to do more of that for the actual project of the game. Otherwise, we may end up with very bland and boring locations, and locations are a big part of a game. And yeah, since I wanted to like reintroduce myself into this whole world of painting, and especially working with landscapes, I turned to some help with that to this very cool, very focused course from this video sponsor Skillshare. And Skillshare is this cool online learning community for creative people. It involves a lot of different directions. And what I found especially exciting is learning paths, which is this new way on Skillshare to approach learning in the form of sets of curated classes that are collected in a meaningful and intentional order. And for myself, I found this learning path called Discover the Art and Science of Drawing to be very timely. It includes seven classes from Brent Eviston, and it brings a powerful journey of mastering drawing, starting with the basics of how to visualize shapes and how you bring your emotions and intentions into the line, and finishing with a versatile shading technique that lets you draw any subject. I found Brent's confident approach and his willingness to share his knowledge to be very inspiring and helpful, so I'll be definitely coming back to learning paths, because this way of learning really brings the experience to the next level. But yeah, this course by Jonas D. Rowe, who is a professional concept artist, is actually the only course he posted on Skillshare, and I find it really cool. It seems like he really pushed all of his 
experience and approach and like the best practices into this one very focused just nine videos really and it beautifully refreshed all of my knowledge in the way I approach painting with the addition of some interesting parts which I found the most interesting and I will be applying it today a lot and we'll definitely talk about the approach I'm planning to use in a moment but yeah if you guys are interested in checking out Skillshare and trying something fundamental or something new on your creative path make sure to check out the link in the video description. The first 500 people to use my link will get one month of free trial of Skillshare. And thank you Skillshare for supporting this channel. Now let's paint. Now in Jonah's course, he divided his approach into several stages. First of all, looking for a lot of references, and we're gonna do that first. Secondly, there was substantial thumbnailing, and we're gonna do that as well, to look for the best shot representing the action. And yeah, after thumbnail, and selecting the best thumbnail that you get. You start working on the shape design. That's where you start defining the main elements of your composition. Uh, the contrast is defined a bit more clearly and so on, the direction of lighting. And these first three stages are like, that's the main work. The rest is kind of more about detailing, which is not as important. And it's not just words. In Jonah's approach, he uses photo bashing. He uses certain um, textures found online. It's all about the license. Like, can you use these textures without any trouble? Because in references, uh, we get to use any photos we want because we don't actually put those pixels into our picture. And probably many of you guys will hate this idea, but how about using the generative tools in the latest versions of Photoshop? So technically speaking, this will be the video where we may be applying AI to add details to our established composition. And I think with this particular approach, where we pretty much take the section where photo bashing takes place and replace it with generative AI, I hope to show the artist's community that you can really use AI to save your time and enhance your results without being replaced by AI. AI as an artist. So the stage of generative or photo bashing detail placement is like this uh, middle second half stage. And um, as we place those pieces, we use transformation tools, we use color correction to fit things properly in place, and then paint on top of them to add rim lights, reflections, to actually finish this painting and introduce more details that we actually find fitting for the situation. So that's the plan. And again, if you hate generative AI things, you can just replace every time I say AI with just photo bashing. So anyway, let's finally start painting. So yeah, thumbnailing is a lot of fun. I forget about it so frequently. <laughs> it's a cool thing and I'm gonna approach it this way. Uh, Jonas in his tutorial did it differently. He actually created a file of a much lower resolution than what he would actually go for. I instead create this big canvas that could actually be a bit bigger. I don't like you know, spending my time on a picture that may turn out really awesome and then is like just 4,000 pixels. I, I wish it would be sharper, you know? Why not just work on a higher resolution right away? So yeah, with this approach of creating just a quick frame and working on it, I feel like you get a lot more flexible. You're not even constrained to uh, like the canvas shape. You can easily extend things very quickly because it's right here, you know, and you have more pixels around it. So I think that's a really cool thing to have. Oh yeah, also, uh, Jonas, <laughs> I'm gonna like rip this whole tutorial into my video. <laughs> I mean, I learned it, what can I say? But yeah, I really like the idea of starting with just one gradient. It's a cool little concept. You just define where the light is coming from. It's a good idea because actually, I feel like any good picture always has one main light. The rest is like secondary. And uh, there's always this important concept that that there always should be something that's the main and most important in a picture. Whatever it is, if there is more than one, one of them should be more important, noticeably and decisively more important than the other one. Using contrast, brightness, size, whatever it is, 
Uh, but yeah, uh, let's see. Like, I don't want to do the tilted camera thing. It's not uh, a thing here. Uh, I want to just see how the light should spread if the camera is just vertical. So this is not like a tilted horizon right now. The horizon is like this. But as I mentioned previously, I really feel like I will be using certain techniques, using certain tricks to introduce not just design of the locations in the forest, but also use the sky a lot. Because the sky will literally be the only light source in the whole world of this. With maybe very rare exceptions, I will add some kind of light somewhere, but mostly it will be a lot of like pretty wild forest. And it will also have like pretty intense uh, fog everywhere, but that fog can blend in with, um, yeah, by the way, mirroring is something I do a lot. I still remember the shortcut on Torbox to mirror the canvas. <laughs> but yeah, it helps you, uh, you know, uh, see if you're doing a good job with the composition. Yeah, I'm actually probably gonna go wider because, uh, you know, games are kind of 16 by 9 mostly. Why would we go with uh, a different shot? We need to make a location that looks good in uh, a modern wide monitor composition. So yeah, I already skipped a bunch of steps. I mean, I didn't really skip them, but like, um, I didn't really look up references online because I already have a lot of references in my head because we have worked on the model of Daddy Long Arms, so that's a very important reference already. Um, also, we kind of have an idea of what the forest looks like from the concept in the previous video, but that's no excuse to not look up more material. And right now, as I started building these shapes, I really felt like I'm really missing some, some fresh idea. And generally, I really try to follow an important rule I came up with, and I'm sure many other people came up with it before me, but if you're working on a new concept, on a new illustration or anything, and you're not looking up any references online or from other sources, because you already kind of like know how to paint things, because you have a certain visual library, like you're even an experienced artist. If you're not looking up anything right now for this particular new piece, you're not creating anything new. Whatever you're gonna paint, you already did that before, and it's not gonna be impressive or any step forward at all. You always should look up new pictures for this new piece you're working on. It's just by default. Any painting should start with the internet. All right, deep forest. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna start looking at things and try to turn on my googling brain. I also forgot one important thing. Actual Daddy Long Arms was shifted in the story a bit closer to the like middle of the level and it's actually in the field, kind of like a wheat field or something like that. So <laughs> let's actually look up that stuff. Let me maybe zoom in a little bit since I'm not capturing the actual iPad screen, so that's what we'll get. Ooh, these things. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna put some of these uh, into the level and make them kind of weird. They're already quite weird. Yeah, so kind of this thing where we have the forest somewhere, but there's also a field. And that's something they always do around fields. Otherwise, if you just have a lot of flat fields for miles, all over the place, that will just create giant hurricanes all the time, like it will be super windy in there. So these like strips of forest in between pieces of fields, they're like this important and intentional thing. They're usually pretty rare, you can see through those trees, uh, because they're just there to create this like wind breaking effect. So yeah, that's the important input uh, for the concept. Here's a beautiful composition. Yeah, just certain patches, somewhat intentional, somewhat wild. I really like this space to work with. So that's something I'm definitely gonna be using. And yeah, of course, I'm not gonna be, you know, following a perfect idea of a field. I really need to make it twisted and weird. This is like the input, but also even, uh, you know, fields in general, they do sometimes spread on the hills. It's not forbidden to have a field on a curvy surface, I think. Maybe it does affect the sun exposure of the crop a little bit, but if it's not too strong, it's definitely okay. 
but more importantly, I don't care about that. The world that John is getting stuck in, it defines certain ways of logic and things get weird just, just because it's not exactly man-made. It's kind of like pretending to be, or more like this is the way John's mind is projecting with the things that happen that get weird. So it's a little bit like an artistic tool where uh, things get weird and things get strange, but they're there to translate the nonverbal feeling that John gets when he is transitioning from his home universe to a different universe, to a universe universe where no human has evolved to be in. So it feels strange on every level. The air is strange, the light is strange, everything is strange. But we can't show those weird things with actual graphics and sounds because that would be just a mess. We're literally defining feelings that no technology is made to show. So that's where we use the classical storytelling tools and visual tools and sound tools to translate just the feeling of oddness that John is experiencing. There's a lot of artistic truth in this whole universe, in this whole uh, design of the world. One important rule with all of that is that it shouldn't be boring. So I, I've seen I've seen quite a lot. I hope I'll keep looking at things at all times. I have this iPad ready right here exactly for this purpose. Now let's keep going with our composition here. So yeah, I think I never mentioned in this video the the whole concept of the location where Daddy Long Arms appears. Uh, there should be a door, and we recently modeled that door. <laughs> so this will be an important piece right here. Let's put it in the rule of thirds because this is a uh, one of the key elements. Should it be like that? Like Daddy Long Arms should be the main thing. <laughs> I guess the placement of the, the whole location. So anyway, there's a door standing without any walls just in the middle of this field. And in front of the door, there's like a muddy place in the soil. Oh my god, I'm really like starting to realize how much I really need to concept this right now. Because I used to have this idea like daddy long arms in the dark forest, pale white skin on the dark environment. But then I also decided that it's gonna be in the field now. Is it gonna be bright in there or is it gonna be a dark place? Like a field feels a lot brighter. What about nighttime fields? Okay, does this have anything to do with reality at all? These feel so staged in a way. Mm, I like the way this crop, like this wheat, looks in here. It's so bushy and wild. <laughs> but yeah, like really, in a field, with the exception of some trees around the horizon mostly, and maybe some like hills going on here and there, you're really just mostly working with the sky because the field is very blank but it is important to keep in mind that this area right here will be the bold spot inside of the field and also another important thing i want to work on is um well like the design of this area should kind of imply that there's no way to approach the door by going around and getting to the door from the behind, you know? So it needs to be kind of not available from behind, but really it may be completely not necessary. And I feel like it's a bit more striking and conceptual to have like just the door in the completely empty space a little bit. Like the field starts at a certain distance and it doesn't matter because like, yeah, you could go from the side, but this this freaking arm is gonna get you no matter which side you're approaching from. So yeah, I mentioned that I'm gonna be working with like the composition of clouds and I'm gonna be using either like photo planes in a game placed in certain areas that show up softly like fade in in the sky at a certain moment as you approach different parts of the world uh, to create certain brightness spots and everything I feel like is gonna be a very useful and very powerful tool o or I'll be using like actual 3d volumetric masses because Unreal Engine has a very awesomely working volumetric clouds engine maybe that will work just fine but we'll see 
So yeah, this spot definitely very dark and muddy and it's gonna be another one of those holes that are a very important aspect of the game. By the way, when I was working on the like that symbol on the door, that's also like a black hole. I think I wasn't quite clear a little bit in the video about how I approached the idea of holes. Some of you guys were mentioning like a black hole, meaning like a cosmic phenomena. Not at all. It shouldn't get any extraterrestrial vibe at all. It's a dark hole. A hole in the soil, a hole in the body, a hole in a wall, a hole where there's something inside of it or a path to something. You don't know what it is. That's like one of the main design tools in this world. You can kind of think about anything as a hole. You know? <laughs> any door any opportunity, everything is kind of a hole. Big brain time. As I think about it, this place will have like a perfect opportunity of adding like one soft light somewhere like, well like higher, like from over here, like uh, this kind of big soft light onto this location in particular. That will give a very cool like surreal vibe to the place. While the sky will be giving this rim lighting, mostly because I, I will do a very strong emphasis on like a light breaking through the clouds behind the door in, in like several places somehow. Okay, I'm going too much into details, we really need to be thumbnailing. This shouldn't be the only thumbnail that I just turned into a painting, otherwise it doesn't count as a thumbnail. Thumbnails are at least two, I should try and do at least two. <laughs> okay, we need to introduce the main parts of the composition, like, so this thing is coming out. Um, Something I'm hating a little bit about the fact that it's just like this hole is just right next to the door. Like it could be so much more complex than that. It could be like uh, there is a lot of almost like cracked ground for instance and uh, this whole place is you know in this kind of like a pedestal area and with that this hole could be like somewhere right here a bit separated. I feel like composition wise it would be much nicer. Really, we get to do whatever we want here because it's a field and then a big bald spot in that field. It can be anything. And we can really separate it like this then, like there's no way to approach the door really, except through the hole. Even though it's, it like doesn't matter, it still makes it a lot more clear that, you know, the arm won't let you get to the door. God damn it, I wouldn't have any of these ideas if I would just start trying to make it work in the game with the models and everything. So useful. <laughs> I... Mm, it doesn't quite work as thumbnailing maybe, but I just wanna create like the same thing. I, I wanna see it from the top, you know? Because I wanna see what the shape of this hole would be. So let's say we're kind of like on the same side from the axis of the scene, but like from the bird's eye view kind of thing. So where does it start and why, you know? And I feel like it should be wider, not just a little crack. I want this thing to like, I hope I won't regret this when I'll try to implement it in the game. It should like softly fold into the blackness of this crack, you know, just deforming the field, like the actual field just goes deep into the ground. It's a weird, soft curve like that, that keeps going with all the crops growing on it as if nothing's going on with the curvature, kind of like inception effect, you know. But this piece right here will be like straight, so the world around it is bent like that. The big question is though, how does it start, right? Like, how does this crack start here? Because we are supposed to be able to just, you know, walk here from a normal land. I mean, okay, what about this thing being this way and all? However, this can really like end like this. God damn it, this is how you build game design because right now I'm getting so many more 
ideas that are actually interesting to look at. Before that, when I just dived into fleshing out the world using procedural content generation and that's it, it was just, you know, flat ground and uh, forest everywhere and sometimes you get a path and uh, a bold spot. A path and a bold spot. And here suddenly a lot of cool things come up. Uh, let's say this thing folds like this everywhere then. Uh, because generally in this whole concept of the game, I like going a lot more, you know, idealistic, perfect. So seeing like this oval in the middle of everything, I don't think it should be like a round place. It should be an oval because we still want, you know, just the door and the and the hole so we need two things but in here maybe like floating floaty somethings which is gonna be something awesome to look at and these floaty somethings will include some weird stuff like suddenly you know a little uh, like a pole somewhere sticking out uh there are some kind of poles or i don't know <laughs> in the fields right Something should be. There are like fences, of course. It's a painting, but that's a fence. Uh, I'm just gonna add the word fence. There we go. So there's a fence with the electric barbed wire, and it's like using very old wooden kind of sticks to support it. And there are also electric poles, like big ones like that. So that's a thing. A windmill. Sure, that would be a bit too much. I need some kind of smaller things, but it seems like there's just uh, like fences are a big thing in the field. <laughs> so hot right now, fences. Oh yeah, like these ones, they use like very long sticks, like nobody's business. Looks like just a ready to use concept art. That is so cool. They're all weird and handmade. Totally makes sense for that to happen in some field. All right, so we can feel free to use some of that stuff. We can even like make the fence, uh, you know, go kind of like this. For some reason, there's a bunch of stuff growing right under the fence. I guess because you can't use like some kind of lawn mower or whatever tractor to remove the grass right under the fence. So it makes sense that it has like some growth. So yeah, some of them are long and yeah, shouldn't forget that they should like curve away and literally just go underground like that. That'll be dope. And yeah, important thing to establish right now is the scale, because I, I don't think I did a good job with that. Uh, the door will be pretty big in this, in this composition here. So, something like this. So suddenly, as I'm placing the door here, the whole thing is not as giant as it felt a moment ago. <laughs> And the fence kind of makes sense, and as I think about it, these sticks could be longer if we follow the concept on the photo. So yeah, with that in mind, this goes like this. Almost feels like a boss battle place, but there is no battle with this thing. There will be bosses in the game, kind of, and they will mostly be the witnesses, actually. And this thing is like beyond that, it's impossible to fight it. I don't know, do I want like more of a crumbly, like not perfect shape here? Like this is definitely a variant, let's have a look at a different one. So yeah, that's where we can go very concepty, using all these bits of ground floating around, defining gravity and so on, and looking really cool, hung up in space. We could like even break a little bit the pieces in here and add like a path of these floating rocks towards the door, but I kind of don't want to do it because it would overwork the area. In here, it needs to be very crystal clear and simple because we already made things very complicated all over the place. Like this was kind of simple enough so far. This is getting like, we can really play around with the amount of these floating bits all over the place. They can even like move in, <laughs> in like a swirly effect or something. I, I really don't think it's necessary. It might start happening when the actual actual arm starts reaching from the ground in a way because honestly like I always felt like as I said like I really want to go as tasteful as possible but without concepting you end up just going boring like nothing then is happening you know like floating rocks if you just use your words it sounds kind of lame and dumb but you can make it work cool you know if you light it right and 
put things in this cool, like, um, idealistic fashion that something, like, almost evangelic is happening. That's cool, that's not just floating rocks, it, it, it's awesome. That's why they do concepts for games. And yeah, like, same thing here, of course. And I guess it's pretty important to keep some space around the hole, because when the level is finished, when the this world is finished, John will get to the door and, like, walk around the hole and get to the door. That way, I feel like we need a little bit more space here. And kind of everywhere, like, the whole space needs to be a little bit bigger. See, I feel like the hole still works best when it's like in the middle of this uh, patch of land. Yet at the same time, there's like plenty of space for John to actually stand right here in front of the door. Yet at the same time, there's plenty of space for John to actually stand in front of the door. Or maybe, of course, when the arm retracts and goes back into the hole, maybe something happens to the hole that it kind of closes somehow. That can totally be a thing as well, like some kind of thorns close it up or something. That way the player also won't think about like, why can't I jump into the hole, you know? Because that wouldn't lead to anything, you would just jump. I would definitely add that thing where you're like, do you want to jump into the hole? If, and if you say yes, you just jump and die in that case, I guess. Because really, what else do you expect from this hole to give you? Okay, I like it. I like this. I'm going with this. What do you guys think? I think it's really cool. But the shot I wanna paint, like this is awesome to have, I'm saving it for sure, but the shot I wanna paint is like this shot, but we need to zoom out because I wanna show the arm coming out of the hole. And right now I'm gonna uh, create this shot based on this one. I'm gonna expand the canvas like this, and this part will be probably like here, because we, we wanna kinda see a, a spot of John, I guess, as well as the arm and everything. So maybe even lower like this, because the arm will be at the top, makes sense. Yeah, I'm also like thinking it will be also a special visual that will be very recognizable. Uh, seeing certain very specific like vertical streaks of light in the sky. In this world, when you get stuck in here, you start noticing these weird lights like this. So yeah, I'll be using some kind of special shapes for that to have a, an unusual effect. So, like, I'm still not quite seeing this place as, like, a nighttime place, you know? I wonder if it's a bad thing. I feel like it should be, like, this kind of daytime, but the clouds are so thick that it's getting, like, really dark, that kind of thing. It gives you a very surreal feeling, you know, when that happens, where the ground looks kind of brighter than the sky, that kind of weird feeling, but it's like it's not night. Okay, I'm gonna use like a pretty bright color to start. Yeah, it's really important right now to follow the scale because it's so easy to make it of a wrong size. So yeah, this interesting aspect about the design of the arm that I did before. By the way, we were mirrored this whole time. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. Um, let, let's just keep that, because that's really the, the shape I'm going with, or whatever. The interesting part of the design is that the arm is kind of like bony and skinny in terms of the fingers and all, but this part is like really wide, so this arm doesn't look like a normal, just default bony arm like mine, and instead this is like super thick. It's like palm almost doesn't get thinner at all at the wrist. I remember someone in the comments told me like, oh dude, you made the proportions wrong, you should look up what arms look like. <laughs> oh, I like the idea that the arm can like take all kinds of interesting shapes this way. Yeah, because the idea is that each elbow will be like the opposite like bending the other way, like zigzagging all the time. That would be the best way to do it, so it would be able to move around better, I guess. Should it be a right arm or a left arm? I'm pretty sure in the model I went with the left arm, but it doesn't matter too much. Oh yeah, of course it's a right arm, but would it be like, you know, why is it a left arm? 
maybe it's a good idea to make it a left arm. Because as I said, like everything feels a bit off to John in this world. And I mean, not to bash on left-handed people, but it's not standard to be a lefty, so it fits. Like, if you get to choose left or right arm in this case, you choose left, actually. Really hard to imagine this contrast to to be this, you know? It's just like aggressively white arm then, like not pale, just white. Like there, there's just no way it would be white, meaning brighter than the background in this case. On the background of like darker soil, of course, but on the sky, even if it's a cloudy sky, it's still gonna be brighter than the rest. No freaking way it will go any other way. This is working very well, like holy crap. This feels like a situation, god damn. So yeah, John. Um, he's like mostly here just for scale, of course. <laughs> yeah. Alright then, um, I think I like it as a thumbnail for sure, even though it's not a thumbnail anymore, as it always goes. But that's the point, we're gonna continue uh, working on this, especially in the background, like we need to work on those trees a little bit. Alright guys, here's the deal. I have like another 30 minutes of content on this video, where I actually render out and work on some details of the final thumbnail. And I decided not to make this episode super huge or throw away a bunch of fun and interesting moments out of it, and instead I uploaded my rendering part to my Patreon page. It's available to all the patrons, even $1 ones, so if you really want to see the remaining part of this process, you can join me on my Patreon page. There you'll also find a bunch of renderings of Daddy Long Arms and other characters from the game, as well as many high-resolution paintings from the channel. And I'm thinking I'm gonna be doing more of this in the future, because I really wanna show more of the process and share more of my thoughts, but it doesn't always work very well with the YouTube format, where you need to keep things a bit more simple and focused. But yeah, this is it. Let me know what you guys think about the concept, and uh, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!